The future of mankind very much depends upon the recognition of the shadow. Evil is psychologically speaking terribly real. It is a fatal mistake to diminish its power and reality even merely metaphysically. I am sorry. This goes to the very roots of Christianity. Evil verily does not decrease by being hushed up as a non-reality or as a mere negligence of man. In Jung's Aeon, he prophesizes the coming of an antichrist. Now, according to Jung, it is already here. We are in the beginnings of this new Aeon. This is why many of those influenced by Jung, including Jordan Peterson, described Aeon as terrifying. So why is the antichrist coming? Well, Jung argues, because the Christian world has not assimilated its shadow. For far too long, Christians believed, according to Jung, that our fundamental nature can only be good. When we do evil, that is not really us. In this way, evil, embodied as Satan, the shadow of Christianity, is ignored. Just as an individual may ignore his own shadow, one can choose to ignore it, but only for so long before there is a moment when everything comes crashing down. This is not just true for the individual. The same applies for whole societies and civilizations. The drama between Christ and Satan, the two brothers and sons of God, clarifies to us psychologically of the split of the God image into two irreconcilable halves. This was a necessary step in the development of consciousness in humans, but it has led to a profound one-sidedness and to a disassociated condition that now has to be corrected. Christ is without sin, of spotless virtue, and Satan is his shadow. No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. The meeting with Satan was therefore more than mere chance. It was a link in the chain. If we look at this biblical drama between Christ and Satan psychologically, we can understand it as the timeless conflict of good versus evil that takes place within ourselves. We cannot have one without the other. The Antichrist develops in legend as a perverse imitator of Christ's life. He is a true and imitating spirit of evil who follows in Christ's footsteps like a shadow following the body. And if we see the traditional figure of Christ as a parallel to the psychic manifestations of the self, then the Antichrist would correspond to the shadow of the self, namely the dark half of the human totality which ought not to be judged too optimistically. So far as we can judge from experience, light and shadow are so evenly distributed in man's nature that his psychic totality appears, to say the least of it, in a somewhat murky light. And finally, psychologically the case is clear. Since the dogmatic figure of Christ is so sublime and spotless that everything else turns dark beside it, it is, in fact, so one-sidedly perfect that it demands a psychic complement to restore this balance. This inevitable opposition led very early to the doctrine of the two sons of God, of whom the elder was called Satanel. The coming of the Antichrist is not just a prophetic prediction, it is an inexorable psychological law. This conflict demonstrates to us that one must assimilate both his capacity for good and his capacity for evil. If one does not do so voluntarily, it will come involuntarily, whether we like it or not. This is a psychological law, according to Jung. So what, what is the evidence of the coming of the Antichrist? Jung says, a factor that no one has reckoned with, however, is the fatality inherent in the Christian disposition itself, which leads inevitably to a reversal of its spirit, not through the obscure workings of chance, but in accordance with psychological law. The ideal of spirituality striving for the heights was doomed to clash with the materialistic earth-bound passion to conquer matter and master the world. This psychological law is emergence of the unconscious opposite in the course of time. Think of it like a swinging pendulum. Jung says that the Christian Aeon begun when Christ was born in 1 AD, lasting until 2000 AD. This time period is that of the Pisces Zodiac, the sign of the fish being a uniquely Christian symbol. 
uttered throughout the biblical stories. Consider the miraculous drought of fish where Jesus asked his disciples to follow him where he will make them fishers of men. The parable of the drawing in the net or Jesus feeding the multitude with two fish. After 2000 AD, we move into a new zodiacal age, of which, as of March 2020, we have now entered. Jung argues this is the period in which the pendulum swings back. In other words, the anti-Christian period, or the Antichrist. Jung gives the example of the Renaissance. The word means rebirth and it referred to the renewal of the antique spirit. We know today that this spirit was chiefly a mask, exchanging the heavenly goal for an earthly one and the vertical for a horizontal perspective, voyages of discovery, exploration of the world and of nature. The subsequent developments that led to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution have produced a worldwide situation today which can only be called anti-Christian in a sense that confirms the early Christian anticipation of the end of time. The climax of this development was marked in the 18th century by the French Revolution, in the 19th century by scientific materialism, and in the 20th century by political and social realism and perhaps in this 21st century. Jung argues it is also not a coincidence that around the time of these events was the creation of Goethe's Faust, who was a real man. A doctor who had mastered conscious knowledge, he knew everything about everything, yet was still unfulfilled and unhappy. So much so, he nearly committed suicide. The devil came to him, whom he made a pact with, so that he could feel happy once more. He looked for this in the material world, of matter, of the senses, in a beautiful woman, for example. He looked everywhere but in himself, which is what he needed to do all along. Jung argues the timing of this story was not coincidental. It heralded the coming of the end of the Christian aeon. Society is now more focused on finding God on earth rather than God in heaven. The idea of God, which has now been replaced today with a science, rationalism and logic, highlights how the human mind has sunk deep into the world of matter, rather than aspiring to the world of the spirit. This is exemplified in the Gnostic myth of the noose, who beholding his reflection in the depths below, plunged down and was swallowed in the embrace of Physis. We believe that the material is the new god, rather than the spiritual. Today, for example, we aimlessly try to satisfy our spirits in things, in buying new clothes, on striving for status, on seeking comfort in food, rather than seeking self-knowledge of what unconsciously directs our lives, accepting coincidences as meaningful, and submitting to this unknown yet all-powerful and generative source which we all feel. One might understand this better if he was lucky enough to be in love. We believe that the solution is on material earth somewhere and we just have to find it. We can never find it there. Like Faust, who tragically searches always outside of himself and refuses to look within. How does one look inward? Well, we could start by acknowledging our shadow. How to do this can be found in our video in the description below. Among the oldest sacred texts in the world are the Hindu Vedas. It says there are four time periods of which we are in the final. This time period is known as the Kali Yuga, the period of destruction. It prophesizes the following events in this time period. Rulers will no longer see it as their duty to promote spirituality or to protect their subjects. They will become a danger to the world. People will start migrating, seeking countries where wheat and barley form the staple food source. Avarice and wrath will be common. Humans will openly display animosity towards each other. Ignorance of dharma will occur. Lust will be viewed as socially acceptable and sexual intercourse will be seen as a central requirement of life. Sin will increase exponentially, while virtue will fade and cease to flourish. Gurus will no longer be respected and their students will attempt to injure them. People will no longer get married and live with each other just for sexual pleasure. Weather and environment will degrade with time and frequent and unpredictable rainfalls will happen. Earthquakes will be common. 
many fake ideologies will spread throughout the world. And perhaps the two most relevant for this video. All the human beings will declare themselves as gods. And secondly, many diseases will spread. As of the dates this video was published, coronavirus has spread to nearly every country on earth. Jung today might point to the breakdown of the cultural relations between male and female in the Western or Christian world is a unique kind of threat, not from the outside, but on the inside. On his deathbed, Jung had a vision of a final catastrophe ahead. He called for his trusted assistant, Marie-Louise von Franz, who says, One of his daughters took notes and after his death gave it to me. And there is a drawing with a line going up and down and underneath is the last 50 years of humanity. When I saw him last, he had also a vision while I was with him. But there he said, I see enormous stretches, devastated, enormous stretches of the earth. I think that if not more people try to reflect and take back their projections and take the opposites within themselves, there will be a total destruction. Today, as never before, it is important that human beings should not overlook the danger of the evil lurking within them. It is unfortunately only too real, which is why psychology must insist on the reality of evil and must reject any definition that regards it as insignificant or actually non-existent.